What's up? Welcome back. And this is another 40 for 40. I'm really excited about this one. It turns out this one is also, you know, I'm doing 40 for 40 because I'm 40 now. And I'm on the other side of it. I started before turning 40 because I wanted to share 40 of my favorite films of all time with you guys. And it gives you a little look at like who I am as a person, what kind of film shaped me. These are not necessarily my top 40 because I'll have to have audio description. And there are films that have audio description that aren't necessarily available on a streaming service uh, or available at all uh, that I can't put up because they don't have audio description. Anyway, uh, so sometimes they're mad and maybe they're a little bit more obvious titles. Um, but I do like the fact that this one is also celebrating the anniversary and it's celebrating its 35th anniversary, almost day and day. This was released on June 22nd and... Uh, just 35 years ago. <laughs> so it's Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And this has audio description on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Uh, this one... This one is special. Um, and this is a film also where I was thinking... How does this translate to the blind people? But conceptually, I always think about that from my years of having seen uh being able to see to where I am now where I can't I'm always like does this make the transition into blindness and the question here is sure <laughs> it, it it does there's certain things that you're gonna miss out on that of course like it feels kind of weird to say that there's always like this wish list of things that I wish I could show blind people but uh I wish there's a, I remember seeing it sort of like a making of featurette for Roger Rabbit where it really highlighted sort of just how special Roger Rabbit was um, and the care that Robert Zemeckis and his team did take with Roger in making sure that this kind of animation, this blend of having cartoon characters on screen with humans really actually looked phenomenal. Uh, it looked believable. It looked like these people did actually live in the same world together. And um, one of those things that they used was they, they had a, a system for Roger and making sure that um, it actually looked like he and Bob Hoskins were actually making eye contact. And if you look really closely in the scenes, they actually are. Um, obviously, Roger's not really there because that would be insane. But, uh, and they use like a stand-in type of device, but they use the, the kind of stand-in device for Bob so that he could look and he would know where... Roger's eyes were going to be so that, that way he could actually make eye contact with Roger in this situation so that, that way they could actually follow his line of sight so he doesn't look like he's looking past Roger um, or to the side of Roger or anything like that he's not holding Roger up and it doesn't look like no he's holding Roger and making it look like he is staring into his soul and it's, it's a really hard thing to grasp in audio description. <laughs> it's one of those things that's really hard to just bring up and be like, hey, let's take a look at this. <laughs> it's such an excellent um, and just high class level. And it's 1988 that they did this. And there were some films that came along after this where they tried to put like an animated character with a live action adult and just uh, didn't, and they didn't they didn't take the love and care cool world did not do that cool world is not the same thing <laughs> you know uh the the, <laughs> the paul abdul and mc scat cat thing is just not it's not the same thing i mean it looks cool but it doesn't have that same level of connection uh that makes you believe that, that these people are really sharing the same space and it's that level of be believability that really sells Who Framed Roger Rabbit, that uh, Bob Hoskins really is living in this world. You know, that that's him and Joanna Cassidy can see these characters and 
they exist. Uh, even Jessica Rabbit, who's arguably the most uh, human of all of them, she looks the most, aside from how she has a nose, uh, <laughs> that looks the most human. Um, she has some great lines, you know, she, about her. She, I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. <laughs> like, it's great. It's a great line. Um, and it, it takes, uh, it takes so much from those early sort of, uh, you know, Maltese Falcon type films where, you know, uh, the guy's sitting in an office and in she walked, you know, uh, she, she had that killer smile and, you know, you can hear like the guy's narration. It feels like that, like that old school investigative gumshoe and he's about to get into this investigation except for in this case it's a really crazy world that this dude lives in and uh he has to find out uh who made it look like that this animated character uh is is being framed who framed roger rabbit and meanwhile on the other end of things, we have Christopher Lloyd giving a terrifying performance compared to, considering the fact at the same time, he was also like Doc Brown. <laughs> this is around the same time. He's still playing Doc Brown. I think this was between uh, Back to the Future 2 and 3. So this is the guy that we still know as being the, 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 the kooky old guy that... <laughs> that that, you know, wants us to drive 88 miles per hour. And, uh, yeah, he's, he is, uh, the perfect person to be cast here. Um, he's terrifying, and his little weasel henchmen are, they all have their own weird, quirky personality, and they're all kind of dumb. There's, like, one of them that's clearly feels like he's the main henchman, and then the rest of them are all just kind of, like, whatever. Um, of course, uh, I think this film does a pretty good job of teaching kids not to smoke. The one that that's always smoking just, well, smoking doesn't work out for him. So, yeah, there's smoking in this film. It was 1988, but the smoking, the smoking one doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't really work out for him. But, uh, it's, it's also great because, and this is one of the reasons why recently we've talked about Who Framed Roger Rabbit, is because of Chippendale Rescue Rangers. And, uh, the fact that, uh, Rescue Rangers kind of did a Who Framed Roger Rabbit in so much that it pulled in all of these other animated characters that don't usually live in the same world together. Well, this one did the same thing. This one had, like, Warner Brothers characters mixed in with, like... Disney characters, and we don't usually ever see that. <laughs> like, Bugs and Nikki don't usually <laughs> team up. Um, that's like, I mean, can't, like, that movie would be awesome if it, if there was, like, a, you know, like, the Looney Tunes and Mickey's gang team up for something. Like, you want to make the next Space Jam? Done. <laughs> don't even use a basketball player. <laughs> Just have it be Disney versus Looney Tunes. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I feel, I feel like so many people would show up for that if it was if it was a a mixed thing. It's it's like uh, DC and Marvel are stuck maybe right now. Maybe there's like a little bit of a vibe, but I guarantee you a DC and Marvel film put together like where you're putting like. Superman and Batman up against Captain America and Spider-Man. <sighs> People would go to that. <laughs> Wouldn't be... <laughs> done. They'd be so surprised it was happening. Of course, there have been the, like those fleeting moments in comic history, but... Um, yeah, if there was an actual film where that happened, uh, game over. That's... That's, that's the... Uh, that's the last button that they can push to save the, their franchises. If Marvel and DC feel like they're fall, they're spitting out of control, the last thing they can do is come together and just make a, a massive film with both with characters from both universes. Um, 
Yeah, so the cameos in here are great, and uh, Baby Herman is is uh, hilarious as usual. Um, and if you did not know <laughs> how to do shave and a haircut prior to this movie, you absolutely will. <laughs> you absolutely will know how to do shave and a haircut. It's uh, never been more important in a film <laughs> than, and it never has been since. So I can't think of a single film where shave and a haircut has been. Uh, as important to the <laughs> to the plot of the film as it is in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, also, Patty Cake. <laughs> it's this. It, it it's just this cheers me up so much. It's a delightful film. It's funny. It's cute. It is everything that it was that it was in 1988, and it's held up for 35 years. This is really hard to do. Uh, is that's when, what we call standing the test of time. Did you create something that is as watchable today as it was when it first came out? And 35 years later, yeah, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is just as watchable, just as fun as when I was five. I'm 40, and I love the hell out of this movie still. I don't even remember really watching this, like, when I was five. I know I watched it several times afterwards, but I don't remember that initial viewing, you know, that very first time. Um, I do remember when uh, Benny used to wander around Disney MGM. They used to have a Benny down there, and they had a couple more Roger Rabbit references at uh, Disney MGM down at Disney World. But... Ever since then, Roger Rabbit has kind of faded away. I don't think there are any mentions of him anywhere in Disney World. I feel like there should be. Um, but he's kind of the forgotten Disney character. Thank God they never made a sequel. Um, they they pitched one. There was one in the, that was, it was in the works. They were going to do it. And then luckily it fell apart because I feel like this singularly just works as one film. We don't need to do anything else. We don't need a remake. Nobody's ever going to be Bob Hoskins and Christopher Lloyd in these roles. Um, Joanna Cassidy, she's even perfect because she feels like she's from, like she understands the time period that this film is from. Actually, of all of the characters, I'll say that, that Bob Hoskins feels uh, he's great in the role and he brings his own sort of gruff charm to it. Um, but, uh, Joanna Cassidy is really the one that, to me, feels like that she watched the films of this period and really embraced, uh, her character and that time period. So, I do have to give her props, even though it's a mostly thankless role, um, being the love interest for Bob Hoskins in this for Eddie. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's the role that kind of put Bob Hoskins on the map after this. Uh, the poor guy, who is a fantastic actor, by the way, when we actually put him in Adult Fair, he did some kids stuff for a while. He got to be in Hook, uh, where he was excellent as Smee. Uh, and then he was in Mario Brothers, where, uh, yeah, then didn't quite work out for him in uh, terms of taking him to superstardom. But I think he's always been a well-respected actor, as has Christopher Lloyd. And rest in peace, Bob Hoskins, of course. Christopher's still with us. So, definitely watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The audio description does a really good job of uh, following these cartoon characters around. I think the narrator did a pretty good job of trying to capture that magic. Sometimes, if you get too serious of a narrator, you're missing the magic of these films. Uh, sometimes if the narrator's too flat, it doesn't work for me. That was one of my notes about Treasure Planet, was even though I like the narrator normally, it didn't work on that film. Um, there's something to be said about these uh, narrators that really kind of put something, that little extra, that little extra dash, because they know that they have to kind of talk up. Like, Roger's doing this. He's coming around the corner. He's behind the desk. You know, it's, it's, uh, 
it may seem like a little bit monotonous when I'm doing it out of context, but in in a film like this that is mostly a, an animated, a quasi-animated comedy, it makes all the difference because these characters are usually doing something uh, a little bit offbeat, a little bit off the wall. They're They're going for a laugh and a flat narration just kind of deflates the film. Luckily, that doesn't happen here. So give this one a look if you've never watched Two Frame Roger Rabbit. Also, if you've never watched Two Frame Roger Rabbit, why? <laughs> like, why? It's celebrating its 35th anniversary, so you can use that as an excuse to make up the difference for having never seen it. Um, it's on Disney+. Plus, and like I have for every other 40 for 40 that has helped shape my life over the years... Uh, like this film has, I, I, I actually have no idea how many times I've seen this film. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Most of them from my childhood. I definitely ranked up a lot of views really early on. And then as I grew up, I do own this on DVD. I do have the DVD of this. So, yeah, I was, I was a few more times. So, uh, I, I don't know. It's definitely above 10. So, I'm giving Who Framed Roger Rabbit an A+. Plus. Uh, I think it's an excellent thing film. I think uh, it's a great representation of the Robert Zemeckis we actually know and love. I don't know what he did with Disney's Pinocchio, but uh, because he has a track record elsewhere, I'm willing to forgive him and move on <laughs> and then go on to the next thing. But he needs to find the magic that he was finding in the 80s with films like Back to the Future and Frank Roger Rabbit. Where's that guy? Where did he go? Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And uh, I have a website, MacTheMovieGuy.com. You can go to Twitter or Instagram and follow me at MacTheMovieGuy. You can go to the audio description project, adp.acp.org. It'll let you know what has audio description and where you can watch it. And you can go to the adna.org. That's the adna.org. And it'll let you know who's doing the narration for your favorite films and television series. That's it. I'm done. I will review another film for you guys and see you on the other side.